This video is sponsored by Omaze. I was once in Hattusas in Turkey, the former Hittite capital and one of the largest cities in the world 3,500 years ago. I walked around mile upon mile of walls, flanked by epic statues of eagle men in what used to be the palaces of the superpower of the Bronze Age. However, standing there in the 21st century, there was nothing left. There were only a couple sheep grazing in the archaeological ruins, and I was the only tourist in that snowy Turkish spring morning. The main thing I thought upon leaving was that this would probably be Los Angeles in 3,500 years. History is cruel and civilizations are spit out and destroyed with relative normalcy. The Aztecs, Romans, Hittites, Assyrians, Macedonians, and so many more risen to greatness and then tumbled out of existence. In this endless cavalcade of triumphs and tragedies, there are standout patterns. Things that can help us understand why civilizations flicker in and out of existence and possibly apply those lessons to the current world. This is a video that looks at what kills civilizations. Life is hard and being a soldier is even harder, and so I'm proud to say we're partnered with Omaze. Omaze is working with the nonprofit Folds of Honor, founded in 2007 by Colonel Dan Rooney, which exists to provide educational sponsorships to the relatives of fallen or wounded veterans. It's depressing to see how eternally the families of soldiers have had to bear the pain of their loved ones in arms. If you donate, you could win a $1.8 million house in Austin, Texas. Austin is a new up-and-coming American hub, and this house is in the Travis Heights neighborhood, with Lady Bird Lake nearby, as well as being near South Congress Street where there's lots of live music. The house is Scandinavian style with a walnut interior. If you participate, this four-bedroom, four-bathroom house could be yours. Enjoy soaring ceilings in a 3,325-foot area to entertain your friends in. I mean, just look at this place. If you somehow don't want this house, you could get a $1.3 million cash prize by participating. With all this going on, why don't you go to omaze.com for the chance to win a stunning new home or become an instant millionaire? Number 1. Being crushed in war. This is the easiest answer by far. Sometimes civilizations just get unlucky and are horrifically crushed by foreign invaders that wipe them out. The perfect example of this is the pre-Columbian civilizations of the New World like the Aztecs or Inca. Although it's up for debate whether or not the Inca or Aztec empires would have survived very long as countries, even if the Europeans didn't arrive, given that both were having immense internal tensions, neither civilization in a broader sense was actually in any danger of falling apart. Civilization in both Mesoamerica and the Andes, or the regions in which the Aztec and Inca empires were based, had gone back thousands of years to 1200 and 3000 BC respectively. It's interesting to see that even though individual civilizations like the Mesa Verde, Wari, Almec, or Mayan cultures might flicker in and out of existence, we can tell from architecture, mythology, and art that the broader themes of Mesoamerican and Andean civilization remain constant across the millennia. Similarly, the Aztec and Inca empires had reached such large populations of 17 and 11 million respectively, or the populations of France and Germany at the time, the destruction of urban civilization would have basically been impossible. However, once the Spaniards arrived, they precipitated a population collapse largely caused by disease that killed 90% of the population and then butchered the native priest and aristocratic class, or the leadership. This brings us to the key point about conquering another civilization, that you need to wipe out the local leadership. Civilizations are primarily dependent upon the elite. If aliens were to conquer America and were to kill the intellectuals, artists, officers, priests, pop stars, politicians, etc., leaving only working people, America as a cultural organization would collapse. People would still eat burgers and speak English, but any sense of higher civilization would be lost. When you go to the bougie parts of Spanish America, you see a civilization that's almost entirely Spanish. Given that the Spanish completely wiped out the native ruling class, the lower classes and peasantries in places like Mexico and Peru often have deep indigenous roots but lack the cultural leadership to say, turn Mexico into Nahuatl-speaking republic or patronize a giant Aztec temple in central Mexico City. Whenever the indigenous rise to power, they have to work inside the Spanish system. Another example of a civilization being crushed by wars with the Carthaginians and Romans. The Carthaginians seem to have largely been doing pretty well before the Punic Wars, around 300 BC, with expanding in Spain and North Africa, and with Carthage being quite wealthy. After several epic wars, the Romans crushed them. By that point, the Romans put the city of Carthage to the torch and even salted the fields around it to keep Carthage from ever rising again. The key point about wiping a civilization out through conquest is that it must be done with overwhelming military superiority. 
The Spanish had guns, germs, and steel, and the Romans had a population far greater than Carthage's. In both cases, the military superiority the conquerors had was so superior they didn't need to use the local ruling classes to subjugate the region. This is in direct opposition to places like India and China, where every conqueror has had to use the native population to manage the conquered peoples. In both cases, the native peasant culture survived longer than the aristocratic leadership culture, often by centuries. People were still speaking Punic or the Carthaginian language as the Roman Empire fell, and there are still millions of Quechua and Nahuatl speakers, or the languages of the Inca and Aztec empires. However, in both cases without the leadership class, the civilization had neither the power nor the courage to act as anything close to important players and remain subjugated. Number two, too heavily aristocratic. The vast majority of failed civilizations come from the early historical level before the civilization reached a threshold of around 10 million people in a not very large area. The Hittites, Olmecs, Mayans, Chimu, Syrian, Indus Valley, Nazca, Tiawanaku, Mycenaean, Kameh, Cretan, and many African kingdoms like Ghana, Kanem, and Zimbabwe fit into this category that we're going to talk about here. These civilizations all share somewhat similar social structures due to being heavily aristocratic. Every early civilization we know of was extremely aristocratic in that they had massive and steep social differences between commoners and the nobility, and then the king above them. In these societies, the king and nobility were viewed as rapacious sharks that would steal from the population. The prevalence of human sacrifice in the ancient world often confuses people today, but makes sense under these steep hierarchies. All of these governments were some form of theocracy, in which the monarchies of the priest class they worked under would act as conduits with the gods. Given that parts of the lower classes at one point or another had to sacrifice everything to their aristocrats, whether through slavery, rapacious taxes, or a military draft, human sacrifice or sacrificing their lives is the next rational conclusion. Sacrifice was effectively a way of cementing the religious basis of the state's power through sacrifice of the lower classes to the broader divine ideal that supposedly held the state together. It often confuses people how easily ancient societies collapsed. Take the Bronze Age collapse in which around 1170 BC, all civilization from Israel to Greece collapsed, with civilizational collapses happening at roughly the same time with the massive Indus Valley civilization and similar collapses in China. People are often confused how barbarian armies almost certainly numbering not more than the tens of thousands, were able to wipe out urban civilizations that numbered the millions that had existed for centuries. The truth is that the peasantries weren't so keen on having these civilizations around anyway. Writing was a way of collecting taxes they didn't want to pay, cities were places for the aristocrats to waste their money, and big armies were a way for their sons to die. When the sea people wiped out the main armies of the civilizations like Hattusas, Ugarit, and Mycenae, killing the armies of charioteers that held the peasantry down, the peasants were happy and had no desire to restore urban civilization. You see similar results to the collapse of Mayan civilization, which due to a series of complex variables that I and literally no one else in the world fully understands, whether a climactic barbarian invasion or environmental degradation, internal war, the Mayan city-states were wiped out. Once the elite were killed in war, the peasants had no desire to rebuild the elite again. There are still many Mayan speakers in the Yucatan, but the centralized urban civilization is gone. The shift away from having these brutal exploitive regimes to more benevolent ones came with the Iron Age and the shift of the horse becoming rideable, which resulted in the barbarians becoming significantly more powerful. This meant that civilization, in order to survive, had to recruit far more soldiers and arm them well. Iron armor is also significantly cheaper than bronze, meaning you can outfit large armies in armor, making a quantity a quality of its own. This was opposed to the tiny Bronze Age chariot armies in which a small elite could dominate over massive peasant hordes with spears. This meant that the old aristocratic order couldn't survive given that the well-armed peasants would just kill the nobles with their iron swords and armor. This resulted in empires becoming far more egalitarian, with republics developing everywhere from Rome to Bangladesh, and the remaining empires either being egalitarian like Chin China, or tolerant and at least trying to be benevolent like the Persian and Maurian empires. When the empires stopped being dicks, they could become way larger by getting more people to work inside them, which is why Assyria looked like this and Persia looked like this, or why the Chinese Zhou dynasty looked like this and the Han looked like this. After this threshold was passed, civilizations got far larger and harder to remove. The Roman or Persian civilizations couldn't be removed by a couple 10,000 attackers since the general population felt invested in them. In a lot of ways, Roman and Persian civilizations still live with us, while the Assyrians and Almecs leave us practically nothing. Number three, becoming too conservative. In all societies, there has to be a balance between conservatism and reformism, if you want to call it that. The conservatives want to maintain the traditions that hold society together, while the reformers try to keep up with how the world continually changes. Both of these, when pushed to an extreme, can destroy a civilization. 
Here we're going to be looking at when conservatism becomes dangerous by becoming too extreme. In most societies in history, chaos was seen as the ultimate evil. In a world with droughts, barbarian invasions, and nearly endless war, change was often seen as bad, and the ultimate aim of the population was towards boring stability. Under these conditions, people actively stood against change, and the ultimate aim of society was return to some distant golden age, whether that was the Prophet Muhammad's generation, perfect Confucianism, or perfect intercaste relations. This has consistently been a problem with Asian civilizations, in which the networks of dependency that people need to have to maintain irrigation agriculture naturally prioritizes cooperation over conflict and serenity over progress. We see in the years after the horrors of the Black Death and Mongol conquests, India, China, and Islam turned toward rabid conservatism trying to perfect traditional ways of being. Women were subjugated, sexual mores became intense, merchants were crushed in exchange for other more virtuous classes, and any non-religiously based intellectual thought was forbidden. This meant that when these societies faced a rapidly expanding and powerful Europe, they simply lacked any frame of reference that would allow them to be able to implement European technology. In China and Islam, the Europeans were seen as historical blips that would go away since both only look to historical precedents, and if nothing like this had happened before, nothing unlike it could happen in the future. Any person not stuck in an intellectual lockbox could see that Western canons were better, and drill was objectively better, but these were societies that had made reform evil. These Asian civilizations had become so conservative as to make them stupid. Although Islam, China, and India still exist as civilizations, they faced centuries of humiliation and or conquest at the hands of the West. In every case, the civilization and the forms it existed is gone, and all three are looking for massive reforms that have changed them into entirely different forms. Another example comes from the 11th century, when the Muslims were invading India. The local Hindu rajas built temples rather than improving their armies, since pleasing the gods towards victory was supposedly more important than actually winning the battles themselves. The millennia-old Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations were brutally weakened or erased after the Persian conquest in the 6th century BC, since their priest classes, who were the practical social nexes of their societies, had become so corrupt and superstitious as to make them entirely disconnected to the populations. The irony is the Persians were so nice they didn't offer an us-versus-them story that would have given the priest classes an enemy to rally the population behind the old gods. Conservatism can destroy a civilization once it becomes so prevalent as to make even the idea of reform evil, so as to make entrenched social interests be able to troll any impossible improvement. Once this occurs, there's a disjoint between the real world and the imagined world that society lives in. In situations like this, reality always wins. Number four, becoming too reformist. While conservatism has a long history of being dangerous, so do reformers. When the reformers gain too much power, they become unmoored from anything except their utopian fantasies, normally with horrific bloodletting like the French Revolution or Stalinist or Maoist Russia. They try to destroy all of society, any moral boundaries, and their opponents so that they can gain total power to usher in their utopia. The easiest example of this is Communist Russia. Saying this will get me a Reddit post saying how evil I am, but Tsarist Russia showed immense promise. It was industrializing rapidly, was a massive food exporter, had a population that was growing insanely quickly, was massive cultural force with Russian novels and music, and was the terror of all Europe and Asia. Just as a projection, Russia's population growth if it worked like any other non-communist nation over the 20th century, would have a population approaching half a billion now. However, Russia is now a shell of a country, with an economy smaller than Canada's and a population smaller than Java's or Pakistan's. There's so little faith in Russia economically that there are more Russian rubles outside of Russia than inside it. What killed Russia's confidence? The Soviet Union destroyed every functioning social system in Russia in order to usher in their glorious revolution in utopia. Artists were tightly controlled, the church was wiped out, the most productive and hardworking members of the population, even down to mid-level peasants, were killed. The state randomly enslaved people for its concentration camps while actively lowering the standard of living in exchange for faster industrialization. Large social organizations and clubs not under the state's control were banned, as were labor unions. People lived under the fear of the secret police at all times. In other words, Stalin and the Communist Party killed every single element of a functioning society that wasn't directly under their control, and that was the plan. Civilizations are held together by informal systems of social trust like religion, family, and regional social structures. The state isn't intelligent enough to manage everything, but extreme reformers aren't smart enough to realize how dumb they are, thinking themselves geniuses and everything that's not under their control is an evil force that gets in the way of the great plan. Societies and civilizations are groups of people that are held together by shared ideals, like that of the value of individual human life and debate in the modern West, or the necessity of expending the Orthodox Church in early modern Russia. Reformers tear down these abstract ideals since they're standards that they can be held against. 
The communist Nazis, Imperial Japan, and Shin Dynasty China were all united in their hatred of traditional religion in one form or another. The destruction of culture and killing a civilization is best exemplified by the communists in China, who tore down thousands of years of cultural history and belief that really thinking. Temples, philosophies, statues, and even leaking out to such horrifying things as killing teachers and burning books. The reformers' hatred for any pre-existing structure even manifested in communists unwarrantedly destroying nature when they didn't have to, since nature is the broadest and deepest structure there is. The China that came out of this is largely soulless, with the Chinese rushing to make as money as fast as possible to fill the vacuum that comes from a polluted environment, a corrupt political system, ugly cities, and any lack of broader cultural or spiritual meaning. I talk mostly with the communists here because they're the best example, but other systems have gone through similar failures to lesser degrees. Qin China in the 3rd century BC was going just as hard as these later communists, but totalitarianism is harder to manage by mule than by train. The Nazis, if they had been allowed to stay in power longer than 12 years, would have probably bent their society and the European continent in general such horrifying ways to allow them to equal the communists in destructive power. Similarly, the Holocaust, which the Nazis viewed as a glorious reform, in many ways caused traumatic effects on Jewish and Western culture that we're still working through. Number 5. Becoming too Apollonian Being Apollonian means being rational and guided by a sense of properness. It is paired with catonic, or earthly, natural, and raw. Both are words you should remember for cocktail parties. There's a theory that civilizations go through three phases, starting with barbarism or our way is the right way and we have the right to enslave and conquer anyone who disagrees with and is not us, followed by civilization, which is when a culture is able to be culturally open, rational, and objectively view things, while also maintaining vigor, followed by decadence, in which the civilization hates and has no faith in its own ability to achieve things, is rent by internal division and cynicism. In other words, as S-tier historian Will Durant said, civilizations start as Stoic and die Epicurean. In general, Europe was barbaric in the 16th and 17th centuries, with the conquistadors and witch burnings, civilized in the 18th and 19th with the Enlightenment Industrial Revolution, and decadent in the 20th and 21st with the horrors of Nazism and Communism, along Alongside Euro dance pop. Barbarism is the excess of the Catonic energy, an example of which is collapses back into tribalism seen among the Maya or Hittites, while decadence is the excess of the Apollonian. When you view the world purely rationally, it gets easy to rationalize away unpleasant things. A piece of advice I give to my friends is that overthinking means you know what the right answer is, but you don't want to deal with it, and that's as true for civilizations as people. An example of a civilization becoming too Apollonian is Greco Roman classical. The Greeks were deeply uncomfortable with the physical world. In science, they thought rational theory was all that was necessary and that doing actual experiments in the physical world was beneath their honor. The Greeks invented the steam engine computer and even sunbeam mirror weapons that they used for no practical purposes since the physical world was beneath them. The Greeks killed themselves economically by over-reliance on slavery. For a gentleman who wants to be completely disconnected from the physical world, having other people work as slaves for you is the most rational policy. The Greeks turned their own gods into beautiful, rationalized abstractions that resulted in their own populations turning to East subversive mystery cults. By the time we get to the Roman Empire, the elite rational class was so disconnected from the peasantry that class tension was the biggest reason that the Greeks fell to the Romans. A big reason the Greeks and Romans wanted to decline was that they had lower birth rates than their neighbors. This makes good sense from an Apollonian perspective. From a purely rational personal perspective, one's not incentivized to suffer by having stuff like kids or waging war, and so the society becomes atomic. Rationality and aestheticism when pushed too far, without heart, result in decadence as people try to please themselves without recourse for broader group goals. We see this with the Roman-Italian elite that became so wealthy and drowned in sexual opportunities as to make them weak. By the time we get to 100 AD, all the leadership of the empire were people like the Spaniards and Syrians, and by 250 AD they were Balkan tribesmen who were barely Romans in the first place. Rome as an Italian civilization died due to its ruling class becoming entirely divided and selfish. When Roman society became heavily slave-driven, there was little in common between the slaves and the masters to work together since one, class is, since one class's purpose was to oppress the other, and the other's was to be downtrodden and weak, which made a horrifyingly inefficient and broken society. We see similar patterns in modern Europe, which has collapsed into decadence since the Second World War. The early modern European civilization that existed since the Black Death was wiped out in the world wars, as all other forms of social power like religion, nationalism, masculinity, and the like were killed at the Somme, Verdun, and Tannenberg. Like Greece and Rome, Europe was rent by immense class tensions and inequality before World War I. In Europe today, we see conditions of low birth rates, inability to coordinate as a continent, and low economic growth and inability to act militarily. 
Europeans have no stomach for the real world of birth, war, and competition. European philosophy is no real world ends anymore, being stuck in dialectics with no logical feedback loop, and European art has no connection to what the population believes or feels. Europe has died to becoming too rational and detached from the world of pain and suffering, which is what gives life meaning. The perfect example of the Apollonian mind when pushed too far is when the Germanic barbarians invaded southern France. The local Roman South French aristocracy refused to do anything about it because they refused to believe that people as uncouth as the barbarians could destroy them because they were stuck inside their own heads so much. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon where I've got the cultural history of America and history of the world that I've written. Or alternatively, check out my social media in the description. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.